Most students think that scoring a band six in biology means endless of hours of study. It doesn't. I studied just one hour a day and scored a 99 plus ATAR on a 96 roll mark in biology, all the while working part-time through year 12. So what actually makes the difference is understanding the underlying concepts, not just memorizing the facts, knowing exactly how to structure responses for maximum marks, and spotting what examiners are really testing in each question. So in this video, I'll show you how to identify and master commonly tested topics across all four modules, the exact framework for writing band six responses for the HSE that examiners love, critical practical skills that frequently appear in exams, and proven strategies to maximize your marks in the final days before the exam. Let's get straight into it. Hi, I'm Bron and I'll start by saying that the key to success in any biology exam is not trying to memorize everything. These exams aren't testing your memory. They're testing whether you can apply your knowledge to new scenarios. So instead of just being able to list the steps of DNA replication, you're more likely to get a question asking how a mutation in DNA polymerase would affect the replication process. So here's how we're going to tackle this strategically. First, grab your syllabus and three highlighters red, yellow, and green. This is what I call the traffic light system, and it will help you identify exactly what you need to focus on. Go through each dot point and be brutally honest with yourself. Green means you could teach this concept to someone right now. Yellow means you'd understand it, but you might be a bit shaky in the details. And red means you're struggling with the basic concept. Most students will find about maybe 40% of their syllabus starts in red, but this is completely normal. What matters is what you do next. This is where we use the 80-20 rule of biology study. Spend 80% of your time understanding relationships between the concepts and only 20 memorizing the essential facts. Let me show you how this works across each module. So for hereditary, instead of memorizing Mendel's laws in isolation, understand how they connect to DNA structure, protein synthesis, genetic variation, and evolution. For genetic change, don't just memorize mutation types. Understand how they affect things like protein structure, cell function, disease development, and evolutionary processes. For infectious disease, focus on understanding transmission patterns, control methods, immunity response, and real-world examples like COVID-19. For non-infectious disease, master the relationship between homeostasis, disease prevention, treatment strategies, and environmental factors. This is exactly what HSC examiners are looking for in those higher mark questions. They want to see that you understand these connections. So once you've got your syllabus glowing green, you need to know exactly how to show that understanding in your answers. So let's move on to how to tackle your exam responses. Let me introduce you to the Peel method. So it's point, evidence, explain, and link. This is the exact framework that consistently scores top marks. Take this question, for example. Evaluate the effectiveness of different disease prevention methods in maintaining human health for eight marks. First, identify the command term. Evaluate means you need to discuss advantages and limitations, use specific examples, make reasoned judgments, and consider different perspectives. Now, let's structure your response. In your introduction, you're going to define key terms, outline main prevention methods, and signal your evaluation approach. For example, you'd write something along the lines of this. Disease prevention encompasses both primary and secondary methods that aim to maintain population health. These methods range from vaccination programs and quarantine measures to screening protocols and public health initiatives. This response will evaluate the effectiveness of these prevention methods by examining their success rates, limitations, and overall impact on public health outcomes. See how the introduction defined the prevention clearly, outlines the main methods, signals will be evaluating effectiveness, uses precise scientific language, and sets up for our peel structure. Now we can move into a first point about vaccination. Here's where you'll use the Peel method. Start with a clear statement that directly answers your question. That's your point. For example, disease prevention methods have significantly evolved, with vaccination emerging as one of the most effective primary prevention strategies in maintaining public health. Then for evidence, provide specific data or examples, like measles vaccination has reduced global cases by 99%, demonstrating unprecedented success in disease control. Then you'll move on to explaining how your evidence supports your point. So for example, this dramatic reduction occurs because vaccines stimulate the production of memory B cells, creating long-term immunity that prevents disease transmission within populations. Lastly, you're going to link back to your question and then transition into your next point. For example, while vaccination exemplifies successful disease prevention, its effectiveness can be limited by factors such as viral mutations and accessibility issues, thus highlighting the need for multiple prevention strategies. Let me show you another example using genetics. Take this question. Assess the impact of modern biotechnology techniques in detecting genetic disorders for six marks. First, let's break down what the question wants. Assess means to evaluate both the positive and the negative aspects. Modern biotechnology signals we need current examples, and detecting genetic disorders requires us to show how these techniques work and their effectiveness. Start with your introduction. It could be something like, modern biotechnology has developed genetic disorder detection 
through techniques such as PCR, genetic screening, and non-invasive prenatal testing. While these methods have significantly improved early detection rates and accuracy, their implementation faces technical and ethical challenges. Now let's use Peel. Your point would be, PCR and genetic screening have transformed our ability to identify genetic disorders before symptoms appear. Your evidence would be the BRCA1 gene testing now identifies breast cancer risk with an 85% accuracy, enabling preventative interventions years before potential cancer development. Then explain by saying something like, this early detection capability stems from PCR's ability to amplify specific DNA sequences, allowing scientists to identify genetic mutations associated with disease risk. And then link it back. So while this represents a major advancement in preventative medicine, the high cost and limited accessibility of these techniques creates barriers to widespread implementation. See how each element builds upon the previous one? This is exactly what the examiner is looking for. Now let's tackle how you should approach the practical skills questions. As I'm sure you may know, two popular experiments are likely to show up in your exam, Robert Cox postulates and Pasteur's swan neck flask. Let's look at this question for example. Design an investigation to test antibiotic effectiveness on bacterial growth. A simple answer would be something like, put bacteria in a petri dish, add antibiotics and measure results. This answer is barely gonna get you any marks because it lacks specific measurements, has no controls, doesn't explain how to ensure reliable results results, misses crucial safety considerations, and fails to show scientific thinking. You need to be able to show the examiner that you understand experimental design. So here's what that looks like. To test antibiotic effectiveness on bacterial growth, we'll maintain bacterial cultures at 37 degrees Celsius to optimize growth conditions. Different concentrations of antibiotics will be applied to sterile nutrient agar plates using the disc diffusion method. After 24 hours of incubation, we'll measure zones of clearing in millimeters, with larger zones indicating greater antibiotic effectiveness. Control plates without antibiotics Antibiotics will ensure any observed effects are due to the antibiotics rather than other factors. Multiple trials will be conducted to ensure reliability of results. See the difference? Instead of a shopping list of variables, we're explaining the relationship between each element of our experiment. We show why each step matters and how it helps us answer our research question. Hopefully, by understanding how you should answer the questions, you'll better understand how to approach studying and preparing for the exam. Having said that though, let's chat about how you should tackle the few days leading up to your exam. This is usually where students burn themselves out trying to memorize everything at the last minute. They pull all-nighters, drink too much coffee, and end up walking into the exam room exhausted. That's not what we're gonna do. Instead, I'm gonna show you how exactly to use these final days strategically. Remember that traffic light system we talked about earlier? Pull it out right now. Look at your yellow topics. These are your quick wins. You already understand the concepts, you just need to sharpen the details. Let me give you an example. Say infectious disease is marked yellow. This means you understand the basics, but you're not completely confident. Here's exactly what you need to focus on. Instead of trying to memorize every single pathogen and the characteristics, focus on understanding. How do diseases spread? What patterns do they follow? And what makes some control methods more effective than others? For example, with COVID-19, understanding how respiratory droplets spread tells you why masks and social distancing work as control methods. This same principle applies to other respiratory diseases. See how one clear example helps you understand the bigger picture? Now let's talk about those red topics. You probably don't have time to master everything at this point if you still have some topics highlighted in red, but that's okay. You just need to be strategic. So focus on the big concepts that examiners love to test. So for example, that could be understanding how DNA structure affects protein synthesis to help you answer questions about mutation, genetic disorders, and even evolution. It's all connected. As for the day before your exam, here's what you're going to do. First, your study cutoff time is 8pm. After that, absolutely no more biology. This is because your brain needs time to process everything you've learned. Think of it as like letting concrete set. You need to give it some time. Instead, spend 30 minutes getting organized. Pack a clear pencil case, check your calculator as fresh batteries, lay out your clothes and set two alarms. Yeah, two. And then do something that relaxes you. Watch an episode of your favorite show, have a shower, listen to music. Don't just start scrolling through biology memes on Instagram. We all know how that ends. Aim to be in bed by 10 p.m. Your brain needs proper sleep to function. You've done the work, now you need to be sharp enough to show it. When your alarm goes off the next day, make sure you eat some breakfast. Your brain needs fuel. Something with protein and complex carbs, maybe. Some toast with eggs, oatmeal, banana smoothie. Skip the energy drinks as well. They'll make you crash halfway through the exam. Aim to arrive 30 minutes early, not to study, though, that time is for getting settled. Find your exam room, use the bathroom, and fill up your water bottle. Being rushed creates unnecessary stress. And now here's what most students get wrong in those minutes before the exam starts. They either frantically flip through their notes, quiz each other on facts, or worse, listen to everybody panic. Instead, do this. Find a quiet spot, take deep breaths, remind yourself that you've prepared for this. You understand biology, you're not just memorizing facts. 
When you walk into that exam room, remember this. The HSE isn't trying to trick you. They're giving you a chance to show what you know about how living things work. You've spent a whole year learning this, now it's just about showing it. Before you head off to study, let me share one last thing that could make a huge difference to your preparation. You know all those strategies that we've just covered? There's a tool that brings all of this together in one place. It has interactive concept maps that help you visualize those crucial concept connections that we talked about, past HSC tests with detailed solutions, and AI feedback on your practice answers. So it's like having a biology teacher available 24-7. You can sign up using the link in our bio. So good luck with your exam. I know you'll crush it.